made and I bow into the created. Now I can stand bold in my heart and mind is sober. Looking to see a sign, my staff turned to a cobra. With magic, they did the same. Refused to fear his name. Hearts remain hard to their firstborns were slain. The knowledge you have is vain. Chakras and Kundalini's, Kabbalah, Tree of Life, Witchcraft and Genies, Mystery School teaching. Of course, it gotta be right. You know it all. Somebody gain eternal life. Were you there when he made the earth? When he formed man's bones, only used the dirt. Were you there when he made the planets? Please tell me how he did it if you understand it. Were you there when he made the heavens? And all their array rested on the seventh. All you have is speculation and theories. Gave us basic commands, we comprehend them clearly. What's the purpose of living? What's the purpose of dying? Who do you believe when everybody is lying? How do you wait fire? Count the sands of the seas. Tell me how many stars throughout the galaxy. Some things only I know. If questions linger in your mind till your eyes close. But here's something you can understand. Fear your his commands to do your man. Shalom, shalom, everybody out there in Hebrew land. Um, this is Aki Shalomo Ben Israel, and um, I want to welcome you to the Project Wake Up Jacob channel once again. I have an interesting study for you. Uh, this came about from a question that someone asked in our Facebook group, uh, Project Wake Up Jacob, and it was a very good question. Uh, there's a lot going on, um, as usual, but especially now with the things that are being told to us in the media, um, health issues. Um, a lot of people are asking, should they get pricked? Uh, and, and because of um, YouTube's rules and regulations, as I, as I witness someone who's been doing this a little bit longer than us, uh, navigate around not saying certain things that may cause the video not to get aired or your channel to be uh, taken off YouTube until we have our own platforms. Uh, I will kind of speak around some things that I pray you'll understand, you listening will know what we're discussing. But anyway, um, so with this health issue that's going on right now, a lot of people who believe as we believe that we are Israelites um, and who understand prophecy, uh, especially as it comes to revelations, are asking how those two things uh, intertwine. Um, whether or not uh, things that may be in what your physician may be prescribing you or giving you uh, could be what prophecy speaks of when it speaks of the mark of the beast. So that brings up an interesting question as to what exactly the mark of the beast is. And as I mentioned in the response to the question in uh, the Facebook conversation, you know, there's another mark that is less seldom spoken of in scriptures that is way more important. It's good to understand the mark of the beast, but there's another mark that is more important to understand as it pertains to our deliverance. So that's what we're going to get into. So I'm titling this study, The Mark of the Beast, but with a question mark. So <clears throat> let's look at some quick definitions. I'm a big definition person, so let's start there. Um, when you read about the Mark of the Beast, it is in the so-called New Testament usually. So we're going to go to the Strong's Greek Concordance. And look at Strong's Concordance number, Strong's Greek Concordance number, G5480, okay, G5480. And what you're going to see there is from the same as G5482, which says a scratch or a etching, a scratch or etching, a stamp, a badge of servitude, 
a sculptured figure, statue, or a graven mark. Um, let's continue. Look at the Hebrew. The Hebrew uh, Strong's Concordance. I want you to go to H. H. Eighty four twenty seven, and we're still looking up Mark. Okay, H. Eighty four twenty seven. And the Hebrew word, if you're in the so-called Old Testament, uh, the Hebrew word for the English word mark is translated in several scriptures, notably uh, Ezekiel, is going to be Tawa, Tawa, okay? Um, and that comes from the root word ta, root word ta. Which is to scrabble, limit, mark, make or set a mark. Um, so what I want to press upon you or impress upon you about this word mark is it's very similar to if you think about the mark that sovereigns or kings would make when they would have a specific ring, signet or seal that they would take the hot wax or whoever was the uh, uh, the person who wrote things down, the scribe for a king, may have the king's seal because if the king was making a decree or sending a letter or anything that was supposed to be on royal stationery, there would be a royal signet or a royal seal. And usually they would melt hot wax and they would put that signet or seal into the hot wax and make that mark and then reproduce that mark to seal that that um, correspondence closed but it would have the royal seal so it would have the mark of the royal family or the seal of the royal family so that that ring that they had may be called a signet or a seal but they use it to make a signet a seal or a mark on the correspondence that was being transmitted. Okay, so I want you to keep that in mind going forward with this study. Um, there's a biblical dictionary, uh, fairly fairly well known, called the Brown Drivers Briggs Dictionary. You may have heard of it referred to as the BDB, and the definition in that dictionary says uh, desire mark mark as a sign of exemption from judgment can also mean a physical mark stamp or authentication a sign of ownership so very much in line with what we were just discussing um, sign of ownership is interesting um, also a sign of exemption from judgment is interesting for what we're going to discuss so let's jump right into this okay so, what exactly do we read about the mark of the beast? Let's start there. Let's go straight to Revelation and dig straight into this, okay? Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. Revelation chapter 13, starting at verse 11. I'm reading from the scriptures translation. If you're reading from the KJV, that's fine, or whatever your translation is. Most of the sun, most of the most of this stuff is going to be the same. Um, there may be a slight variance in how something is worded, but the sentiment of what we're reading is going to say. So I'm not a big person that's going to jump on you as far as like you have to read this version or that version or whatever version. Um, in my household, we, we read several versions. When I first started studying this stuff, I would open up three, four, five versions all on the table and try to see exactly what the differences were. Um, um, th that's how we study. That's how we show ourselves approved. Okay. So I'm reading from the scriptures translation, starting at Revelations chapter 13, verse 11. And it says, And I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all authority of the first beast in his presence and cause the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. 
verse 13. And he does great signs so that even he makes fire come down from the heaven on earth before men. And he leads astray those dwelling on earth because of those signs which he was given to do before the beast, saying to those dwelling on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword yet lived. Verse 15. And there was given to him to give spirit to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause to be killed as many as would not worship the image of the beast. The image of the beast. Keep that in mind. And he caused all, both small and great, and rich and poor, and free and slave, to be given a mark upon their right hand and upon their forehead, and that no one should be able to buy or sell except he that has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So that's the first place we read about it. We read that there's this time, and most people who understand or come from a Christian background are familiar with this time in prophecy when no one who, ha who does not have the mark will they be able to buy or sell unless they have the mark of the beast. Um, but did you catch that part about the image of the beast? That those people uh, were killed who would not worship the image of the beast. I want you to keep that in mind going forward. Let's go to Revelations 14. Okay, Revelations chapter 14, we're going to start at verse 9. And it says, He also shall drink of the wine of the wrath of Yahuwah, or Elohim, which is poured out undiluted into the cup of his wrath. And he shall be tortured with fire and sulfur before the set-apart messengers and before the Lamb. And the smoke of their torture goes up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day or night, those worshiping the beast and his image. Also, if anyone receives the mark of his name. Okay? I'm going to read that again. The smoke of their torture, whose torture? Those who, uh, those who worship the image of the beast or receive the mark of his name. Okay? They shall drink of the rind of Yah's wrath, which is poured out undiluted into the cup of his wrath. And he shall be tortured with fire and sulfur before the set-apart messengers and before the Lamb. Verse 11. And the smoke of their torture goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. Those worshiping the beast and his image and if anyone receives the mark of his name, those worshiping the beast and his image and anyone receiving the mark of his name. Here is the endurance of the set apart ones. Here are those guarding the commands of Elohim and the belief of Yahushua. Okay. The endurance of the set apart ones is to endure through what we read in verse third in chapter 13 about those may even being killed for not worshiping the image taking the mark of his name right but then we read here that those who do take the mark or worship his image have a different ending which is forever and ever from Yah. If you have not read the book of Maccabees, and those of you who have, I'm sure it already puts you in that in that mind frame, read the books of first and second Maccabees in the Apocrypha, and you'll read about a mother and her sons who were told to defile the temple and to, and to defile themselves in order to live. And that mother prepared her sons and she watched each one of them be tortured and killed in front of her eyes, still praising and calling on Yah, because they understood that to defile Yah's temple, or even to defile themselves, to live for that moment, would not be worth giving up deliverance and everlasting life. Okay, read that. 
first and second Maccabees in the Apocrypha. Let's jump to Revelation chapter 16, verse 2. Chapter 16, verse 2. And the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and an evil and wicked sword came upon men, or mankind, those having the mark of the beast and those worshiping his image. So, again, you see the mark of the beast, and people talk about that, but we keep seeing a worship of his image being tied to that. And I'm asking you, as part of this discussion, as part of this uh, study, what is the image of the beast? What's the image of the adversary? What's the image of the dragon? What's the image of Satan or HaShaitan? That's what I'm asking you. To answer that, I'm gonna ask you, what was the image that Yah created Adam and Eve in when he first created everything? If you go back to the book of Genesis and he created Adam and Eve after he created everything else and he said everything was good, and he said he created mankind in his image. What is the image that he created them in? Was that a physical thing or was that a spiritual thing? What do you think? Let's go over to the book of Galatians and keep that question in mind. Is it a flesh issue or is it a spirit issue when we speak about the image of Yah, the image of the beast even? Right? Because we know he's a copycat. So a lot of the times what Yah does, he's going to do something that is very similar, but the complete opposite. Right? So we find that one is a physical or spiritual image. The other one probably is as well. So, book of Galatians chapter 5, starting at verse 19. The book of Galatians chapter 5. Verse 19, and it reads, And the works of the flesh are well known, which are these, adultery, whoring, uncleanness, indecency, idolatry, drug sorcery, hatred, jealousies, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, Ever heard that term, dissension in the ranks? There's dissension in the ranks. Factions, F-A-C-T-I-O-N-S, factions. Envy, murders, drunkenness, wild parties, and the like, of which I forewarn you, even as I also said before, that those who practice such as these shall not inherit the reign or the kingdom of Elohim. That's verse 21. Those who practice, such as all of those that we just listed, shall not inherit the reign of Elohim. And when you get a chance, I want you to look at what a faction is. Most people are fully aware of what a faction is. Remember cliques? When you had elementary school, grade school, remember people used to form cliques? That's what a faction is. Technically, what a faction is, is um, a smaller group that's broken off from a larger group. I'll give you an example. The body of Messiah is a group that we read about when we're talking about whether or not we receive deliverance, right? The body of Messiah is what we read about in Corinthians. We speak about him being the head and the members being many, with each having their own functions as given to them by Yah. And we read that in Corinthians and it says, how was the, how was one member of the body able to say of any other member, I have no need of you? You're not. You can't do that. Only Yah, only Messiah, the head, one of those will be able to do that. Yet, if we recognize that the body of Messiah is the whole and then look at the separations off of the body of Messiah. And I'm talking about among the nation of Israel with what we call camps that are exclusionary of other people and pointing fingers and saying who going to hell and who not and what they doing and what they need to do and all that. That's a faction. That 
is a faction that's listed here among the works of the flesh. You understand what I'm saying? We gotta do better, Israel. We have to do better. Having a having an assembly here and an assembly there, that's not the same thing. There were several assemblies that Paul or Shaul traveled to. That's not the same thing. They were not they were not backbiting and 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 gainsaying one another. You understand what I'm saying? Based on a lot of times very trivial things. Sometimes these matters are very serious and need to be discussed. But there's a method in which those who study should be bringing things before one another to be judged by one another according to scripture whether these things are of Yah or not. So that somebody bringing something to the body that is not of Yah should be shamed and removed. You understand what I'm saying? So anyway, those are the works of the flesh. And it says, those who participate in the likes of those shall not inherit the reign of Yah. Let's move on to Galatians verse 22. It says, but the fruit of the spirit. And I ask you before we go any further, what spirit is it talking about? It says the fruit of the spirit. What spirit are we discussing? We are discussing Yah's set apart spirit what you formerly used to call the Holy Ghost before you knew better. The Ruach HaKodesh in the Hebrew tongue, the set of our spirit. That's what we're discussing. It says the fruits of that spirit. Remember, John says, test every spirit, right? Whether they be of Yah. Whether they be part of this spirit. Because there's a lot of spirits out there. So we have to identify what spirit we're dealing with based on whether they're operating according to what we read through verse 20 or whether they're operating in according to what we're going to read now in these following verses. Okay? So it says, but the fruit of the Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, the set of our Spirit, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, trustworthiness, gentleness, self-control against such there is no Torah. Against such, there is no law. There is no law saying that if you exhibit these spirits, you have a punishment coming. You understand what I'm saying? There is no law against operating in this spirit. Okay. So I want you to notice here that Yah is compared to the spirit. These, these attributes are compared to Yah, okay? While the works of the flesh are attributed to the adversary. You understand what I'm saying? So if we're asking ourselves about the image of Yah and the image of the adversary, we know someone by their works. We know someone by their fruit. We know someone by their spirit. And if you want to test the spirit, this is how you test the spirit. This is the image that they are clinging to. The image that they cling to and the image that they worship is the image that they walk out every day. You understand what I'm saying? If they operate according to the flesh, that's the image they're beholden to. If they operate according to the spirit, that's the image that they're beholden to. And we'll prove that going forward, okay? So let's look at the book of Romans, chapter 6, verse 16. Here's what Shaul or Paul says about the matter. It says, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves servants for obedience, you are servants of the one you obey, whether of sin to death or of obedience to righteousness? What is Paul saying here? He's simply saying this, whatever you do, Physically, whatever you allow your members to participate in, if you present your members, when I say members, I'm talking about your physical limbs, hands, legs, mouths, ears, eyes, mouth. If you eat sin, you're sinning. If you eat sinful things, 
If you do sinful things with your hands, you're sinning. If you walk towards sin instead of walking away from sin, you're sinning and you're moving closer toward eternal death. That's all he's saying. However, if you eat what's okay and righteous to eat, if you have righteous thoughts on your heart and on your mind, if you use your hands to do righteous and good things, if you run away from wickedness and run to righteousness, then you are presenting your members toward righteousness. You serve obedience. You are, you are putting your treasures in the heavens, as scripture says, where neither rust nor moth can destroy. Don't that make sense? Don't that make all the sense in the world? Let's look at another scripture. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. It says, Therefore the Torah became our trainer unto Messiah in order to be declared right by belief. So the law, the Torah, the instructions, the first five books of the Bible that list all of the laws that we are supposed to live by in order to be walking in accordance with Yah was our trainer unto Messiah. I'll give you a short testimony. Me and my Isha, me and my wife, we first came into this uh, understanding of truth simply by keeping the Sabbath. When we were presented with, and Yah opened our eyes to the fact that we were supposed to keep the Sabbath set apart, that was the only thing we knew. We did not understand ourselves to be Israelites at that point. But because eventually we began actually reading the book for ourselves, we saw that we were Israel. And then we started practicing the other laws, the dietary laws, um, uh, and all of those things. The next thing that was made manifest to us was the Messiah's name, Yahushua. Now, we were using Yahushua in, in, originally, and I'm, I'm okay with anyone that, that uses that. We're saying the same thing. Um, but we were presented his name after following the law. In other words, the law opened our eyes to understanding Messiah. And then we began to see the difference between JC, I'm using initials, the difference between JC and Yahushua the Messiah, that they were actually two completely different characters. One telling you it's okay to sin and one never said it was okay to sin. One that... The world says died so that you can sin and eat all the things that y'all said you're not supposed to eat and do all the things that y'all said you're not supposed to do as long as you show up for Sunday morning service and pay your tithes and offering. Messiah never did that. Never said that. He was not about that life. You understand what I'm saying? And so the law literally helped us to be able to see and understand Messiah when he presented himself to us. When he knocked, we were ready to answer because we were following the law. So that's what that's talking about. And my question to you is, who do you serve? We're talking about what your members do and how that dictates who you are in obedience of and who you are in servitude to. So I'm asking you, who do you serve by what you do, right? Look at 2 Timothy. Chapter 2, verse 19, it reads, However, the solid foundations of Elohim stands firm, having this seal. Yahuwah knows who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Messiah turn away, turn away from unrighteousness. It says Yahuwah knows who are his. He knows who are his. They have a seal. What's a seal? Then it says, let everyone know in the name of Messiah. Turn away from righteousness. How could you say the name of the Messiah is not important? How could you ever say it's not important? If his name is the name of deliverance. And, and scripture says there's no other name by which you need to call on to be delivered. How is his name not important? Answer me that. But anyway, I digress. Um, so Yah says, uh, 
his his foundation stands firm and has this seal that he knows who are his. So next question I would have to ask after reading that, if it was just me studying this even for my first time, it's just how my mind works, is how do we make it known to Yah that we are his? He knows that we are his. He knows who are his and who are not. How do I wave that flag to say, hey, here I am. <laughs> I want to be known to be yours. I want to be on that side of judgment when that time comes. Wouldn't that be something you want to make sure of? Like even not for, for his knowing, but for you knowing. How do I know that I'm his? Let's go to the book of Matthew, chapter 19. And I hope it didn't go past you that we just discussed a seal, which, as I, as I said, a seal and a mark and a signet is all the same thing. Their purpose is the same. It says, he knows who are his, meaning they are marked or sealed for possession, meaning they belong to him, right? Okay. So it says, uh, Matthew chapter 19, verse 16 says, And see, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good shall I do to have everlasting life? And he said to him, Why do you call me good? There is no one good except one, Elohim, Yahuwah. But if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. I'm not going to even go into my soapbox about all the people who tell you you don't have to keep the commandments. But this clearly said, if you want to achieve everlasting life, keep the commandments. How in the world you can say anything that Paul may have ever said that you thought was something contradictory to this would trump what the Messiah himself said? I don't understand. But with that, I will say this. If you thought Paul said something contradictory to this, you are the one who misunderstood. Paul kept the commandments. Paul did not teach not to keep the commandments. So if you thought he was teaching not to keep the commandments, you're the one with the misunderstanding. And, and, and we, we can do a study on that as well. Uh, as a matter of fact, there is another brother out there who has a very good uh, study uh, on that topic. It's called misunderstanding. Uh, it's called Understanding the Misunderstanding of Paul. Not that Paul had the misunderstanding, but you, who don't understand. Um, that's presented by Brother Shofar of Swords of Zion. Very good understanding that Brother has. Shout out to him. Um, understanding the Misunderstanding of Paul. As a matter of fact, uh, Brother Yerushalayim also has a good study on that. I can't think of the name of that study right now but I'll post it in the comments with a link if I can. Yeah. So anyway, he says, uh, if you wish to enter everlasting life, this is Messiah speaking in verse 17 of Matthew 19. Uh, keep the commandments, guard the commandments, guard the commandments, guard the commandments. Guarding, guard is a little bit different from keeping. That means not only am I doing them, but I'm protecting their importance by standing on how important they are to anybody asking. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. Revelation chapter 22, verse 14. And it says, Blessed are those doing his commands, so that the authority shall be theirs unto the tree of life, and to enter through the gates into the city. Now, the tree of life was in the Garden of Eden. So was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if you remember, especially those of you who probably are, are studying scripture series, if you remember when we talked about the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, y'all don't like mixing, right? So Adam and Eve was created to know only good. And y'all said that I'm putting you in this garden that is in Eden. And you can partake of any tree here. Right? The tree of life was there. The tree that leads to everlasting life was there. But so is that tree that was 
a mixture of the understanding of good and evil. And because they partook of the tree that mixed the understanding of good and evil, not only were they removed from the garden, but they were cut off access to the tree of life. And Yah specifically said, now that they are partaking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they can no longer have access to the tree of everlasting life. Think about that. Because here, Yah says, those who are doing his commands and practicing only good, at this point that we're reading about, can now have access again to the tree of life and they can enter into the gates of that city. That's heavy. I want y'all to ponder on that, okay? Second Ezra, Second Ezra chapter two, verse 38. And it says, rise and stand and see at the feast of the master, the number of those who have been sealed. See the number of those who have been sealed. So again, I want you to remember at the beginning of this, I told you there's another mark that's more important than the mark of the beast. And if you see, I'm building a case here, and I hope you see where I'm going, that Yah knows who are his, and those who are his will be able to partake from the tree of everlasting life, will be able to see deliverance, will be able to enter in the gates, into the gates that we call salvation, the gates that will be called deliverance. And that mark is way more important than the mark of the beast. But at the same time, they're, 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 they're contrast to one another. And what the adversary does is he makes the mark of the beast such a big thing. And I'm not saying it's not important to know it, but what I'm saying is he makes it such a big thing that sometimes you can get caught up in worrying about that and not secure your spot in the kingdom by making sure you're sealed by Yah, if that makes sense. So what I'm saying is, I'm not saying don't be aware of what's coming. Look, we watch these TV series, you know, you got the zombie apocalypse over here, World War Z over there, um, you got uh, the Walking Dead and New Walking Dead and all of that. And, uh, you know, they present all kind of cures for those things and some things they say may cure those things and some things they say, you know, those cures and those pricks that they're trying to give you in your arm, um, may cause those things, may cause a zombie apocalypse. I don't know, you know, I don't know. So I'm not gonna give you a false uh, statement about that like I know. And anybody that is giving you um, a statement like they know those things, be a little bit concerned. I'm gonna focus on what I do know. And I submit to you that you should focus on what you do know, what's solid. And that is keep these commandments and get your seal that Yah knows who you are, that you may enter into the kingdom of life. And at that point, you won't have to worry about the mark. They may kill you for not submitting to what they want you to do. We read that in Revelations. It's okay. If you die exalting Yah, if you die exalting Yahusha, that's a good thing. There's a special place for those people. You understand what I'm saying? And I'm telling you what books is. I'm not telling you no cult like crazy understanding or nothing like what you know Islam is telling them. No. No. I'm telling you what book says, what thus says, yeah. Right? And if you're comparing these books that we read here that we call the Standard 66 or the Bible with any of those other so-called religious texts, the Quran or whatever, this is the only one that has prophecy. I've dabbled into all that stuff. In my search to find the truth, I looked at Buddhism, Taoism, Islam, uh, Pan-Africanism, one percenterism. You know, I used to want to be a Mason at one point in my life, all that. This book is the only one that has our history. And it's also the only one that has prophecy. Prophecy that has been proven to be prophecy if we look at history, but also prophecy that we still see being fulfilled today and prophecy that is going to be fulfilled in the future. 
some a little bit distant, some very near. That's the book I believe in. This one. That's the one I believe in. You can keep all those other ones. So anyway. Um, so I want you to notice here that those doing his commands, those who are practicing his commandments and having the witness of Messiah are the ones who are mentioned as being sealed. That's the takeaway from these scriptures that we read. Uh, second address, chapter 2 again, verse 45. Second address, chapter 2, verse 45, it says, And he answered me and said, These are they who have put off mortal clothing and have put on the immortal. And they have confessed the name of Elohim or the name of Yah. Now they are being crowned and receive palms. Yes, they are being crowned and receive palms. The book of John, chapter 12. The book of John, chapter 12, verse 13. It says, took the branches of palm trees and went around to meet him and were crying out, Hosanna. Blessed is he who is coming in the name of Yahuwah, the sovereign or the king of Israel. Now look, I'm not going to go into this right now, but palms is one of those things that you must have lawfully. It's part of the law when you practice the feast called tabernacles or booths. There are some Israelites out there, and you may be watching, who still don't understand the importance of, of studying the Moedim, the feast days, of practicing the feast days. And what, you're, and what I'm trying to tell y'all when we go over those studies that we have on our website and on YouTube about the importance of studying and practicing those feast days is that these are appointment times that tell you about prophetic events that are happening and help you get into practice so that when those events go live, you are prepared. Palms is necessary at the Feast of Tabernacles or Booth. And here we see palms among those who are sealed. They're given to them at that point in their walk, at that point in prophecy. What does tabernacles or booths mean? Check out that study we did on the website. ProjectWakeUpJacob.com uh, and check out the Feast Days Overview, Overview of the Morning, and we dig into that a little bit, the significance of tabernacles, the significance of the Feast of Booths. So anyway, um, it says that these are those who are sealed and they have put off the mortal and are putting on the immortal. They're doing away with the fleshy and they're putting on the spiritual. They're doing away with the flesh and are becoming spiritual. I said it both ways on purpose because depending on where you are in your understanding, you understand what I'm saying. You're putting off the fleshy things and putting on spiritual matters. And there's one point in prophecy where it says you're going to put off the flesh, literally, and put on the spiritual, literally. In the twinkling of an eye, you'll be transformed. Anyway, so who are these uh, with the more important seal or mark of Yahuwah? Who are these that we're speaking of specifically? Revelation chapter 7 verse 1 says, And after this I saw four messengers standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on earth, nor the sea, nor any tree. Verse 2. And I saw another messenger coming up from the rising of the sun, holding the seal, the mark, the signet of the living power, the seal of the living power, Yahuwah. And he cried with a loud voice to the four messengers, to whom it was given to harm the earth and the sea. So this messenger is coming with the authority and the seal of Yah. 
and he tells the other four messengers with the authority of Yah, right? Verse three, saying, do not harm the earth nor the trees until we have sealed the servants of our power upon their foreheads. What did he read about the mark of the beast? On the forehead. Coincidence? Remember I told you he's a copycat. This one is more important. Until we have sealed the servants of our power, Yahuwah, in their foreheads. Understand that without Yahuwah's seal, you are marked with those who are counted as the beasts. In other words, if you do not have the mark of Yah, if you do not have the seal of Yah, when that time comes, you may as well have the mark of the beast. You understand what I'm saying? I'll give you an example. If you think about the book of Exodus, the very last plague that Yah rent on the Egyptians was to kill the firstborn of every household. And Yah told Moses to tell everybody to put a mark on their doorposts, to mark the lentils and the threshold of every door. So that's the top and the two sides of every door with the blood of a lamb that they slaughtered. This was Passover. This was the first Passover. And he sent a death angel through the whole land of Egypt. And everyone, it don't matter if they was a good person in your opinion or my opinion or not, who was not in the know, who did not hear and do. What Bruce Lee say, it is not enough to know you must do. Everyone who heard and did not walk out their faith by works. Faith without works are dead. Everyone who did not mark their doorposts as they were told to and be obedient, that household found dead the firstborn of mankind and of beasts. You understand what I'm saying? A lot of times y'all will give us instructions and examples in the so-called Old Testament and in the so-called New Testament, but he'll give us examples of how he operates. And Malachi 3.6 says he don't change. So if he show you how he operates, believe him. When he talks to you about prophecy and things he's doing in the future, he's going to operate the same way. If that makes sense. I pray y'all can hear me. I'm out of town. I'm in a hotel. Uh, but I wanted to get this recorded and I'm trying not to yell so that I've heard outside my window, outside my door. But y'all willing, you can hear me just fine. So um, why is y'all sealing or marking his people? Well, a man gave that away. It's to be preserved from destruction. It's to be preserved from destruction, from the lake of fire, what some refer to as hell. I'm going to give you another example of how y'all operated in the past, in addition to the example I just gave you about uh, Egypt. Turn with me to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 9 and verse 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 6. And if you think back about what we just read in Revelations, about the messenger or the angel, Malachim in the Hebrew, um, having the seal of Yah and crying out to the other four messengers not to harm the earth until Yah's people were sealed. I want you to remember that as we read this because that's prophecy. Now we're reading history. Okay. And that's how we work this book. We read line upon line, precept upon precept. That's what that's talking about. Uh, someone giving you a scripture and telling you that that by giving you one scripture um, it's okay to eat meat because um, because y'all said don't call anything that I created uh, unclean quoting that verse I know that I know that's a big one um, 
but that's the only verse they can come up with, or you don't read the whole book chapter together. It's out of context. They're twisting understanding. If you want understanding in this book, you should be able to find that Yah is saying the same thing from the front of the book to the back of the book and all the way through the middle because he don't change. We just we just agree. He said that, right? Malachi 3 and 6. So he's not going to tell you to do something and then all of a sudden flip-flop on you. As a matter of fact, he repeatedly tells us what to do over and over just like we tell our children what to do over and over because we are hard-headed and stiff-necked. And he understands that and he loves that and he wants us to be delivered. So he gives us ample opportunity to get this thing right by repeatedly telling us. And it takes a long time for y'all to get angry. It takes a long time to provoke y'all to wrath. And I'm not saying that's a, a, a green life. You do what you want to do because you got a few times you think you can get away with something. Nah, I'm not saying that. You may be trying to do something wicked and die in the middle of your wickedness. And guess what? If you die in the middle of your wickedness... It is what it is. So that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is he knows that we hard headed and he knows that generationally, just like it was generations uh, uh, of Israelites coming back to the commandments coming out of Egypt, because the commandments were in the earth before Moses. Yah was reinstituting Yah's laws and commandments into the earth during that time. And it took practice for them to get those things right. You understand what I'm saying? He understands that we're dealing with a very similar situation. This is modern day Egypt, where we're at right now. We're waking up and 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 reclaiming our heritage now. Um, so this is also going to take practice. So anyway, um, Ezekiel chapter nine, verse one. Looking at this repetition or this uh, example that he gives us. From history and it says and he called out in my hearing with law with a loud voice saying let the punishers of the city draw near each with his weapons of destruction in his hand and look six men came from the direction of the upper gate with faces north each with his battle axe in his hand and one man stood in their midst and one man in their midst was clothed with linen and had a writer's inkhorn at his side. That is something to record, like a scribe. Remember I told you that certain scribes who wrote and transmitted communications on behalf of the king would also have the king's seal so that after he sent a message from the king, it would get the, the king's royal seal and you know that this came from the word of the king. I'm telling you, but I'm telling you this with the authority of the king, which means the king is telling you. You understand what I'm saying? So this one was clothed with linen and had a writer's inkhorn at his side. And they came in and stood beside the bronze slaughter place. And the esteem of Elohim, of the Elohim, or the power of Israel, went up from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the house. And he called the man clothed with linen who had the writer's inkhorn at his side. And Yahuwah said to him, passed through the midst of Jerusalem, passed through the middle of the city, and you shall put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within the city of Jerusalem. Mark those who cry out about all the abominations within the city of Jerusalem. Seal those who cry over all the wickedness among Israel. That's what he said. And 
To the others, he said in my hearing, pass on into the city after him and strike. To the other messengers, he told, I want you to come through behind him and slay. Do not, uh, do not let your eye pardon, do not spare. Family, that means he was talking men, women, and children. Do you understand? At this time, because Yah is slow to anger, right? At this time, when it gets to this point, it is no more time for you to try to get it right. That means you have already had to have been practicing righteousness, walking in the spirit, and doing the things that Yah said you need to be do, doing in order to be spared from the destruction that is the day of Yah, the day of judgment, okay? So he says, kill to destruction old, young men, maidens, and children and women. Do not come near anyone upon whom is the mark and begin at my set-apart place. So they began with the elders who were in front of the house. What house? Yah's house. Yah began this judgment at his house, at his set-apart temple, at the slaughter place. And anybody who those who that Malachim did not mark with his seal, he killed. He started his judgment at home. He gonna start his judgment on Israel again, y'all. We were judged 400 years. 400 years we had to endure not keeping the law, statutes, and commandments. Now you have the opportunity, now that you're waking up, to come back to the laws. Come back to him in spirit and truth and walk this thing out. Get your seal. Get sealed. You have the time now. It's very important. They may try to force you to do something that you know, according to scripture, you should not be doing. I would not recommend it. You would have to kill me first. And if that's the case, again, read first and second Maccabees to build up your endurance, to build up your faith. There's a line in this brother's song that I love Brother uh, Dawi Chalia, you got a line that says, I found something I would die or go to jail for. That is this. I wouldn't go to jail or die for nothing frivolous. But for this, I would die for. For this, you could lock me up. For not keeping these laws, statutes, and commandments. Or for you trying to make me break them. You might as well throw me in the hole. I'm not doing it. Get your mark, y'all. Get your seal, the seal of Yah. You get the seal of Yah, you ain't gonna, you're not gonna come nowhere near the mark of the beast. I promise you. Okay. So, um, again, parallel that with the story of the Exodus, like I just told you. Those who's marked are spared. Those who are not, you are not spared from the judgment. Um, so what is your sign? In addition to keeping the commandments and knowing Messiah so that we can be sealed. What is his sign so that we can be sealed? Let's look at the book of Exodus. Give you some, some tools, some ammunition to put in your, in, your, in, your, in your safe when you're having these conversations with someone else or even when you're watching the news. Some things to keep in your, in your understanding some things to meditate on. Go back and read these things more fully. Read these, as, as I'm reading these chapters and verses, read the entire chapters. Or if you're doing your read through from beginning to end, revisit this when you get to it again, in context. See that I'm keeping it in context. Hold me accountable that I'm keeping this in context with the scriptures, because that's our charge. As we study to show ourselves approved in order to share these, in, these things, unashamedly to, to share these things without being ashamed and know that you're speaking what Yah says, what thus says Yah, you should be able to do that. 
but you also have to hold me accountable. You understand what I'm saying? So Exodus 31, 13, it says, and you speak to the children of Israel saying, my Sabbaths, my Shabbats, you are to guard by all means for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations to know that I, Yahuwah, am setting you apart. What else are we talking about but being set apart? There's a lot of different ways to be set apart. To be set apart literally means to be separated from others. And keeping the Sabbath separates you from those who are not keeping the Sabbath. And Yah says, this is a sign. This is a sign. You're doing something that I told you to do. You understand what I said? Okay. 31 verse 16. And the children of Israel shall guard. Again, keeping and guarding is slightly different. Very similar, but there's a slight difference. Shall guard the Sabbath. Again, Maccabees. To perform the Sabbath throughout their generations. An everlasting covenant. What does everlasting mean? Last year, this year, next year, when he first said it, all the way to kingdom come, quite literally, everlasting throughout the generations. 17, this is an everlasting covenant between me and the children of Israel. It is a sign forever. For in six days, you who were made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested, and was refreshed. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. Says, And I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me to know that I am Yahuwah who is setting them apart. How many places you need to read that? That's three witnesses. Let's read another one. Exodus 20, verse 20 says, And my set apart Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you to know that I am Yahuwah, your power, or your Elohim. So the Sabbath is a sign. But is it in itself the seal of Yah? It is a sign, but is it a is it the seal? Remember, even the scribes and Pharisees kept the Sabbath, right? I'm not saying that that don't mean you need to keep it. I'm just saying that that's not necessarily the seal. The scribes and the Pharisees kept the laws. The Levitical laws, the dietary laws, the sacrificial laws, didn't they? Does that mean that they are going to the kingdom? Does that mean that they're going to be receiving everlasting life? Or is it something else? So you need to keep the commandments. It includes the Sabbath, which is a sign of the covenant between us. But what is the seal? As we read before, the law is a schoolmaster or a trainer unto Messiah Yahushua, right? Yahushua, who is also called the Comforter and the Ruach HaKodesh, or the Set Apart Spirit. Yahushua is the name of the Comforter. Read in the book of John, chapter 14. 15, 16, read all three of those chapters. He says, the comforter, I'm going to send back the comforter who shall come in my name. Let's look. But check this out. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 12 says, for us to be the praise of his esteem, those having first trusted in Messiah, in whom you, having heard the word of truth, the good news of your deliverance, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the set-apart spirit of promise. So the set-apart spirit is the seal. Remember we started in Galatians talking about the spirit of which is called the Ruach HaKodesh, the set apart spirit, that's the seal. Let me give it to you again in Ephesians chapter four. That's the mark we're striving for, y'all. Ephesians chapter four, verse 30. 
and do not grieve the set apart spirit of Elohim by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The day of redemption and the day of judgment go hand in hand. The day of Yah, also known as the day of judgment, the whole world will be judged. But some will be redeemed. Again, I go back to Exodus. Egypt was judged, but a handful of those in Egypt were redeemed. I go back to Ezekiel 9, we just read it. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, was judged, but a handful of people were redeemed. How was it known to the destroying angel that Malachim who was sent to destroy the destroyer? How did he know who was being preserved for redemption and who was there to be destroyed? He knew because they were sealed. They had their seal. They had their mark of Yah. Get the Ruach HaKodesh. That's the most important thing. More important than the mark of the beast. Because if you get the Ruach HaKodesh, you will not accept the mark of the beast. You're not going to be fooled into accepting the mark of the beast. Because everything that they're asking you to do is going to be in line with worshiping his image. And as we discussed, worshiping his image, Galatians 5, does not correspond with worshiping the image of Yah, which is the fruits of the Spirit. They do not co-align. You cannot walk that way and be in agreement with Yah. So as long as you're walking in parallel with Yah, you will not be parallel with the image of the beast. I'm saying this in a lot of different ways. I'm hoping that one of these ways sinks in to someone listening. I pray. It is Yah's will. Hallelujah. Uh, so let's look at the placement of the mark. Is it physical or is it spiritual? Where the, where the mark was placed on the head, in the hand. We read that. We read that for the mark of the beast. We also read that Yah's seal will be in our foreheads, right? Okay. Is it physical or is it spiritual? Revelation 14, chapter 9. says, And a third messenger followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receive his mark upon his forehead or upon his hand, Yah uses the same imagery of the head and the hand. Here's the physical imagery. The priests, which, which we are supposed to be a nation of, right? If we go back to the, to the law, we read that the priests had a physical mark. Let's read it. Exodus chapter 39, verse 30. Exodus chapter 39, verse 30 says, And they made the plate of the set-apart sign of dedication out of clean gold and wrote on it an inscription like the engraving of a signet or a seal. And it said, set-apartness to Yahuwah. So this was a signet, sign, and seal made of gold, placed on the head of the priests that says set apart, preserved even. Do not touch this one. We're supposed to be a nation of priests, right? So should we all have a gold plate on our forehead? Some people put gold plates on their forehead. I'm not knocking that. You can do that. It's fine. But was that a physical thing that Yah is asking us to do this day and age? Should we all do that physically? Or is it a spiritual thing? Let's look at Exodus 13, verse 9. In Exodus 13, in verse 9, this, this uh, passage that we're getting ready to read is talking about the feast or the moed, uh, referred to as unleavened bread. That's what it's talking about here. And it says, And it, unleavened bread, shall be a sign to you on your hand as a reminder and between your eyes that the Torah of Yahuwah is to be in your mouth, for with a strong hand 
I, Yahuwah, uh, for with a strong hand, Yahuwah has brought you out of Egypt, or Mitzrayim. So this is a sign. Unleavened bread on your hand, between your eyes, and in your mouth of what Yah did bring you out of Egypt. Let's continue. Exodus 13, verse 16. Now we're talking about Passover. Passover. Verse 16 it says, and it, Passover, you, you practicing Passover, you practicing unleavened bread, shall be a sign on your hand and is frontless between your eyes. For by strength of hand, Yahuwah has brought us out of Mitzrayim. Still think you don't need to practice the feast days? Keeping the feast days is a sign in your hand and in your head. Okay. Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting at verse 7, I'm going to read 7 and 8. And now this is in reference to the entire body of the law. That's what this is in reference to. It says, and you shall impress them, the law, upon your children and shall speak of them, the law, when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. Verse 8. And shall bind them as a sign on your hand and between the frontlets of your eyes, the law. Deuteronomy 11. I know, I know sometimes my Isha and my wife say I overdo it with the witnesses. Scriptures say by two or three witnesses. By the mouth of two or three witnesses shall so all things be established. Maybe I do overdo it a little bit, but I'm, I'm attempting to drive this home. Yah provides us with numerous, more witnesses than we can uh, uh, count of the things that he's telling us. And so I understand I got children. Children are hard-headed. The children of Israel are hard-headed. We're hard-headed. Sometimes you got to tell children over and over and over and over and in different ways because everybody don't receive information the same way. And so you may have to phrase it this way, and phrase it that way. And if it's y'all's will, at some point, one of the ways it came across at that particular moment in their life, when y'all opened their eyes and their ears to hear it, they heard it. And somebody said, oh man, wait a minute. I got it. Or let me or let me rewind that and repeat that. You know, so I give multiple witnesses. I do. Hopefully, it's not too many. We are gonna wrap this up in a minute, though. So Deuteronomy 11 and 18, and this is in reference to Yah's entire word, his whole word, everything that he instructed us to do, but including this. It says, "And you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart." And in your being, and shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. That's your head, right? I keep I, I keep doing that to say, hand, head, hand, head. Repetition, right? The sign is in the same place. Okay. As we can read, a sign on your hand is dealing with your actions. Keeping the feast days, keeping the law, speaking about the law, practicing the law. That's your hand. That's what you put your hand forth to do. If I pick up something to read it, I'm leading with my hands. If I pick up something to write, I'm leading with my hands. Okay? That's an action. That's an action. And so that's why it says the mark is going to be on the hand. It's about what you do. Okay? And it says it's going to be on your mind. It's frontless between your eyes. Don't deal with this mess. But I used to be trying to figure out what people was talking about when they talking about the third eye and all that. The cerebral cortex and all that. You ain't got to worry about all that. What's on your mind is on your heart. Y'all said she's judging your heart and your kidneys. 
Your kidneys is what filters out the impurities in your body. So that means you is judging your heart and he's judging what you filtered out. How have you done getting rid of stuff that you weren't supposed to be doing? How have you done getting rid of stuff that you're not supposed to be thinking? You understand what I'm saying? And now, what's on your heart? What's on your mind? What you thinking about? What do you meditate on? What do you spend your time doing? You understand what I'm saying? Are you asking God for discernment about these laws, statutes, commandments? Set apart days, the feast days, also known as Moedim. Or are you being lazy? Are you letting someone tell you that you don't have to worry about it because we're not in the land? Are you tell, letting someone tell you it's okay to eat unclean foods because uh, you, you can you can bless your food now. You can save grace over it and clean it by, by, by doing something dumb like that. <laughs> you gotta rebuke that. You got to learn to study, to show thyself approved. A workman that need not be ashamed, rightfully able to discern the truth. Rightly able to administer the truth. So yes, <clears throat> the mark on your head and in your hand is dealing with your thoughts, your heart, and your actions, what you do. That's what that's talking about. Romans 6.16 6, says, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are, to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death, whether of disobedience unto righteousness. Hold that scripture. Hold that scripture in your heart. What you do, I don't care what Christian tell you, that it's not by your works. That's a lie. Book of James say, faith without works is dead. Abraham exhibited his faith by his works. Noah exhibited that he had faith in Yah by building an ark. Right? We exhibit we have faith in Yah by keeping his commandments. How else? How else do you exhibit your faith but by your works? Let's come back to common sense, y'all. We have been brainwashed long enough. Stop letting people send you off. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. Um, Romans 6, 19. I speak after the manner of man because of the infirmity of our flesh. For as you have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness and to inequity, unto inequity, even so now yield your members, servants to righteousness and to set apartness. So just like just like you used to do unrighteous things now that you know better, make that pivot unto repentance and do things that you know are setting up your treasures in the kingdom. Work righteousness. Do works of righteousness. Meditate on righteousness. Allow righteousness into your heart, into your mind, so that you're not just doing the works like the scribes and the, and the Pharisees, but you are getting the set of our spirit, which will seal you for the day of redemption. Does that make sense? The mark is symbolically what is in your mind and heart, what you do. Remember, Jeremiah 17, verse 10. I, Yahuwah, search the heart. I try the kidney and give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. If you are a tree, your fruit will be what you produce. Your fruit will be your works. Yah says, I judge every man according to the fruit of your works. So who that out there telling you 
is by faith, not by works. You have to understand Paul. If you're going to read Paul and hold on to Paul, you can't misquote Paul. When Paul talk about faith, he is not saying you don't have to keep the commands. Paul kept the commandments. Paul had ample opportunity to say he didn't keep the commandments. He never said he wasn't keeping the commandments. His works was to keep the commandments. So if you think Paul was saying he wasn't keeping the commandments, again, you have a twisted understanding. So I'm going to close out with a few scriptures here, y'all. Uh, Malachi 3.14 says, You have said it is worthless to serve Yahuwah. And what did we gain when we guarded his charge, his commandments, and when we walked as mourners before Yahuwah of hosts? And now we're calling the proud blessed. Not only are the doers of wrongness built up, but they also try Elohim and escape. Verse 16, then shall those who fear Yahuwah speak to one another, and Yahuwah listens and hears, and a book of remembrance is written, your name written in a book, of those who fear Yah, meaning you kept his commandments, and those who think upon his name, and they shall be mine, says Yahuwah of hosts, on the day that I prepare a treasured possession. And I shall spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Do you believe that you are the body of Messiah? If you believe you are the body of Messiah, then that means that you are a part of the body of his son, whom he says he will spare. Attach yourself to the body of Messiah. Attach yourself to the Ruach HaKodesh. Verse 18, then you shall see again the difference between the righteous and the wrong, between one who serves Elohim and one who does not serve him. Either you get sealed by Yah with the Ruach HaKodesh, or you will be susceptible to the mark of the beast. But those who are sealed by Yah will not do the things that caused them to accept the mark. They will hear his voice, and they will only do his will. Ecclesiastes, last scripture, book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verse 13 says this. Let us hear the conclusion of the entire matter. Fear you, Elohim, and guard his commandments, for this applies to all mankind. Another translation says, this is the entire duty of man. Fear Yah. Keep his commands. If you fear Yah, you won't do the things that he told you not to do. You keep his commands, you'll get your seal. Let all praise be to Yahuwah, by Hashem, Yahusha, Hamashiach. If any understanding is got through this uh, transmission, through this recording. And with that, y'all, I say Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. If it's the Shabbat when you're watching this, I'll see y'all next time out there in Hebrew land.